So I think we're on. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for attending this session. I'm going to turn over very quickly to Dr. Zida Mohammed. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, can I have some highs in the, the chat just to know that because we can't see the audience actually. Um, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's 11.15 p.m. here um, for some of us in Malaysia, uh, but we are so awake and happy to be with you here virtually in the session. Um, hello, my name is Azida Mohammed, and my colleagues and I are a team of action researchers who have been collaborating in this area of place-based citizen science, and we are very happy to be a part of this method session under the TIPS conference. Um, so let me just show my screen now. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, so these are the members of our team of action researchers. Um, Sarah and I are two academics. I'm from uh, University of Malaya, Malaysia, and Sarah is from Cardiff University in Wales. Um, in this project, we have been working with bright young leaders, Afan, Asia, and Eddie. Um, Afan and Eddie, who is also my research assistants in University of Malaya, to get, together they were the co-founders of the University of Malaya Water Warriors Living Lab in 2013. Then in 2016, together with Eddie, they founded Inspiracy Kawa, a rural community-based social enterprise focusing on watershed ecotourism and advocacy. And finally, in 2021, Afan and Asia founded Sekita Kita, a university-linked social enterprise focusing on place-based environmental education, and I act as their advisors. In 2018, the Malaysian members of the team were extremely lucky to have crossed path with Sarah. And since then, we have been learning a lot from colleagues in Sustainable Places Research Institute at Cardiff University on the place-based approach. And together, we started to co-develop the so-called EcoHeart Place-Based Citizen Science Program for Watershed Management, building upon the trans translational research work on the hardware approach and citizen science that the team in Malaysia has been embarking on since 2013. So if you want to know more about our work in these two areas, um, we have provided all of our publications in the session webpage here, which we will make it available to all. So you can look here at the hardware approach research, um, so we provide all the, the papers and also the presentations that we have done before. So, um, what exactly is the EcoHeart Place-Based Citizen Science Program? In a nutshell, um, it is a collaborative uh, effort by our two universities, uh, U University of Malaya and Cardiff, to promote care and local action for sustainable development goals through a novel place-based citizen science program implemented by locally based youth led social enterprises in the context of participatory water quality monitoring for watershed management in Malaysia. And when we talk about watershed management, predominantly we are focusing on the intersections between SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, with the goals of ecosystem protection of SDG 14, life below water and SDG 5, 15, life on land plus the goals of reducing pollution through SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, and the goals of encouraging sustainable practices through SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. So uh, the philosophy behind our work is the so-called hardware approach. It is an approach that University of Malaya have been working on from our past research on Asian-oriented integrated watershed management with our Japanese collaborators in the past, where we hold the premise that implementing hardware approaches in terms of advanced scientific and technological solutions and having the right software approaches here in terms of having the required institutions, policies, regulations and finance would not be sufficient if it is not rooted on strong hardware approaches. Here we define the hardware approach as an organic and voluntary approach driven by internal motivations based on shared local values. So coming from Asia, this was somewhat easily agreed upon between the Malaysian and Japanese researchers. 
as cultural heritage and collective values still play a very significant role in influencing motivations and social actions in Japan, Malaysia, and most uh, communities in Asia. So for instance, there is more openness in using shared values based on religion and spirituality in Asia compared to the West, for instance. So this, is, this then can uniquely shape the drivers behind participatory approaches and citizen movements in Asia including movements in citizen science. And this is where place-based approach can enhance the hardware approach as it can help to refine our understanding on the interlinkages between local spaces, local communities, local knowledge, and local values. So in terms of our innovation, uh, this, uh, this idea or this philosophy of hardware, of hardware has led to our innovation in the so-called EcoHeart Place-Based Citizen Science Program, where we develop our own understanding on citizen science methods from a place-based perspective, which we coin as Place-Based Citizen Science, or PBCS. And based on this methodological perspective, we have produced tools and processes that is in line with the PBCS approach. In terms of tools, this includes the EcoHeart Index, which is a heart-shaped visualization of scientific data that can combine scientific analysis with sociocultural narrative. And this is supplemented with a selection of place-based interpretive materials and water quality monitoring tools. And in terms of processes, we have our own unique uh, take on how the process can be more participatory and co-created by the local communities with the actual researchers and stakeholders. A bit later, Sarah, Afan, Asya and Eddie will explain in more detail about our innovations. However, before I pass the screen to them, let me just brief you with the status of our experimentation on this place-based citizen science method to date. So this is our experimentation in terms of, uh, so what we have done is we are starting our experiment of this method at the river watershed that is close to our hearts and significant to our local community, which is the Slango River watershed in Malaysia. So closer to hope, this is basically because the University of Malaya campus receives 100% of its water supply from the Slango River, meaning we are dependent on this watershed for the attainment of SDG 6 for the campus community. So for now, what we have been uh, experimenting um, is um, what we have done is we have uh, experimented with the method at the downstream area of the Slango River watershed with the downstream local communities and stakeholders. And we, uh, and we have started this experiment since the year 2020. Unfortunately, the experiment was very much limited by COVID-19, but we still managed to conduct some level of experimentation with the help of our partners among the local communities and stakeholders. In addition to its significance to the University of Malaya campus, the Slango River watershed is also very critical to Malaysia as a whole, as it provides 60% of water supply to the Klang Valley, which covers three main economic growth areas in the country, which includes the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, the administrative capital of Putrajaya, and the state of Slango, one of the most developed states in the country. However, although the Slango River is so critical for the country, it is increasingly experiencing disruption of water supply due to more frequent incidences of industrial pollution, especially in the middle stream where the development activities are concentrated. And this, in addition to other long-standing pollution issues from solid waste disposal, agricultural pollution, and sand mining. Uh, the newspaper here, uh, here are from the year 2020 and 2000. 2021 highlighting this water supply disruption issue. So in order to address this challenge, the Malaysian government has been implementing a lot of hardware strategies in terms of putting in place scientific and technological solutions and software strategies in terms of setting up new institutions, policies, regulations, and pumping money in the process, and yet the problem persists. After so many years, many decision makers are realizing that these hardware and software strategies are not sufficient without a strong hardware foundation. This means we need to build a stronger voluntary collaboration between all stakeholders to protect the watershed. So the EcoHeart PBCS program, um, this we suggest from the team, is a potential way forward. I will now pass the screen to my colleagues, first Sarah, then Afan, Asya and Eddie to explain to you more about the EcoHeart PBCS program. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Zida. I think you're going to share a slide for me. Yeah, uh, if that's possible. Thank you so much. Um, 
thank you, um, Zida. So what I'm going, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how we have come to develop the place-based citizen science approach. And um, Zida, could you maybe move to the next slide for me, please? So as you can see from the aspirations of the program for watershed monitoring, place emerges as being something of considerable interest to designing a locally relevant program of watershed management. The concept of place can be understood in a number of different ways, however, firstly as a geographical area or a location, which is largely understood as a dis discrete frame for connecting people and their differing worldviews and interests. This concept of place is quite useful for situating global challenges, as explained by Zida, and is also represented here by the map of a specific watershed, that of the uh, Selangor and the Klang River. The place can also, but place can also be a phenomenological concept in which the boundaries of a place are shaped by past memory of a community, by their current living and future expectations. So this concept of place is useful for a localized framing of values and attachment. It understands place as a product of lived and collective knowledge, practices and aspirations, and as a site of meaning. But place can also be understood as a site where the relationships between the environment and people are shaped. And this concept is useful for understanding system or processual relationships and interactions. And here we've represented it between the rural and the urban, but also between what could, that both of these areas could represent in terms of their uses, their practices and their purposes at each site and the watershed as a whole. Zita, can I ask you to move to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Which is when I've uh, lost my place on the slide, so I apologize, I'm coming back to this now. Okay, so within citizen science, in order to develop and apply goals for future sustainability, we must consider, we feel what people care about and what motivates them to engage in sustainability issues and place-based approaches and methods supply a range of insights into the context, its geography, cultural and meaning and other um, contexts, which integrate these insights in a way that is relevant to citizen science. We see great potential for harnessing what others have referred to as the power of place for integrating these social and scientific aspects in a way that is consequential for our approach. It literally shapes how we engage in citizen science. For example, it promotes thinking at the intersection of communities, the geographical location and the science, and it also shapes the limits of what citizen science is able to do. So for example, it could restrict the efforts to apply science only in a purely of functional way. So invoking a sense of place is already considered critical to engagement in citizen science. But we would argue that the methodological considerations of place are not often fully realized in a way that leverages these theoretical and conceptual histories of place-based thinking and work, both in academia and policy. And this may be just due to the uncertainty over which place approaches should be used and which are most useful. The construct of place is diversely understood and applied across social sciences, and this may have implications for scientists wanting to make use of social science concepts and approaches. So our goal is to show how to use place-based approaches in a user-friendly way in citizen science, which also seeks to methodologically transform citizen science and integrates a set of core place constructs, such as place attachment, local and indigenous knowledge, and stewardship and public participation. So in place-based citizen science, citizens, uh, scientists work with researchers or sorry, citizens and uh, scientists work together to collect and analyze scientific data to solve questions that are relevant to the sustainability, sustainability aspiration of a particular place or local area. While also noting that place is more than a geographical location and that our understandings of place are always in relation to other places, people and meanings. So in integrating these approaches, we have identified a number of key criteria of place-based citizen science. Apologies, I thought I'd turned my phone off. So place-based elements um, are integral to 
are an important precursor to the design of the program. So this is especially those that significantly shape the relationships of local community and stakeholders in their specific localities. It recognizes the importance of integrating robust scientific knowledge with that of local knowledge and the valuing everyday knowledge that people hold about their local um, environment. It emphasizes similar ethical considerations, those that relate not only to uh, environmental and ecological protection, but also to the long ter term social welfare and empowerment of the community. It emphasizes the provision of humanistic meaning and effective value to the processes of citizen science with an aim to produce a heightened sense of place and stewardship for the conservation of a particular uh, place. And it contributes to an innovative form of citizen science um, by uh, integrating these perspectives. So just one um, final slide from me, if you could move uh, forward, Zeta, thank you. So integrating place in this approach then occurs at each stage of the program design. The consultation phase, for example, for this project was in an in-depth approach to gaining familiarity with the community and building trust. The first stage of the program was building, a, working together to build a coffee table book in which collected stories, images, art, accounts of practical actions involving the river told the story of the watershed. This process was not merely just the process of producing a book, but it established the ethical foundations for the project, which included a non-extractive but a co-produced approach, a deep understanding of the changing and diverse uses, value and meaning of the watershed, and a commitment to action and involvement in the community and the actions taken already to improve the river. And it was only after this work was done, intuitively at the time, could the next step phases of the programme be developed. At each stage, understanding and integrating the expression of place was key, whether it was sharing the aims of the project to understand how citizen science for water management could be locally relevant, but also how the citizen science could be conducted in a way that was relevant uh, to the practices of, of people's everyday lives. To explain the method in more depth, I will turn you over to the other members of our research team. Thank you. Everyone, um, I'm Asyang and this is Afai. So um, the purpose of this session is to demonstrate how this knowledge that we have learned from our community is... Afan, we cannot see the video. And the location for this study. All right, sorry. So Afan and, and Asya have prepared a video to take you through the, the message. Here we go. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm Asya and this is Afan. So um, the purpose of this session is to demonstrate how that we have learned from our community is integrated in the design of this space-based citizen science toolkit. And the location for this study is at it's actually at, at a rural area in Malaysia and the place is called Kuala Selangor and they have this beautiful river there named Selangor River. So actually when we first wanted to start this student science program, we organized several consultation sessions where communities from different parts of the river was invited to our co-production or uh, participatory action research process where we then designed the student science program together. Um, but just to demonstrate uh, a simplified version of how this was done since the beginning, a short reenactment, re um, we will only talk to one representative today. Uh, Alright, so onwards, I will pass this session to Afan. Hi Ikram, thank you for joining us. Ikram is someone who we worked with since 2013. At that time, he was only 13 years old. He is active in the environmental group that we established together uh, called Express Tower. Furthermore, we also work with him on the Pasangan Coffee Table Group. Ikram, could you introduce a little bit about yourself and the place where you live? You can talk in any language uh, that you are feel comfortable with. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Ikram. 
I am member of Inspirasi Kawa and uh, environmental group uh, in Kuala Selangor that focus on river conservation. Okay, uh, firstly, my place is famous for the firefly tourism center around Sungai Selangor. Uh, fireflies are the focus of uh, tourists from all over the world. Therefore, it uh, will be a source of income to our local rover in our place. Uh, apart from that, the Selangor River in our place is also a source of water and food for the local here. Not only that, 60% uh, uh, of the water source for the resident in the Klang Valley uh, area is also from Sungai Selangor. Besides that, our communi communities stay uh, three around Sungai Selangor as a source to make the paru, which is a traditional roof that is still used in brick. Uh, uh, other than that, lots, uh, locals, our locals also come to the river to catch various types of fish and shrimp. All right. Um, Ikram, can you describe any local water problem that your, uh, your community face? Okay, uh, for that, uh, for more comfortable, I will uh, stay in Malay. Okay, sure. Uh, so, uh, banyak aktiviti ekonomi manusia yang menyumbang kepada pencemaran air uh, di kawasan kami. Salah satu daripadanya adalah aktiviti pengorekan pasir. Aktiviti ini membuatkan air sungai menjadi lebih keruh. Dan baru-baru ini, aktiviti ini juga menjadi salah satu punca banjir di mana berlakunya hakisan tebing dan seterusnya air sungai melimpah masuk ke kawasan darat. Selain daripada itu, kawasan kami dikelilingi, dikelilingi dengan aktiviti pertanian terutamanya penanaman kelapa sawit dan juga pisang. Pembukaan tanah uh, secara tidak terkawal sehingga menyebabkan kawasan riparian terhakimus kemusnahan habitat juga juga ketika aktiviti membaja seperti aktiviti membaja dan meracun dijalankan apabila hujan turun semua uh, semua ini akan turun dan masuk ke kawasan sungai lah uh, itu dan kawasan kami terletak di kawasan hilir tanpa daripada seluruh kawasan hulu akan turun ke kawasan kami tambah pula fasiliti pengurusan sisa juga kurang memuaskan di area kawasan kami lah Based on the problems, um, what kind of monitoring can be useful for? Okay, uh, for me, one of the most suitable monitoring is water quality monitoring. Uh, we always wonder, with all the pollution going on, how the state of our river clean or dirty like that. All right. Okay. So from from this water quality monitoring. Um, how it can, uh, how it could be useful for to who? Uh, yeah. Okay, it can be uh, useful for our own community, especially in having a more sustainable lifestyle. Uh, for example, they can reduce the use of fertilizer for plantation. Uh, the data is also useful for relevant agency where we can share the data with them. Uh, yes. Okay. So as what Ikram mentioned just now, um, sand mining can cause turbid water. So we can use turbidity is one of the parameters to measure the cloudiness of the water. Uh, how about agriculture, Ikram? Uh, what kind of pollution do you think that uh, coming from agriculture? Oh, uh, um, pollution coming from agriculture, I think it's used a lot of fertilizer and uh, pesticide. Ah, all right. So usually fertilizer contain nitrogen and phosphorus. So we uh, can we can also more sort of like measure phosphorus uh, inside the water to, to see how much nutrients uh, inside the water. How about other activity? Do, do in at your place? Do you have any industrial areas nearby? Yes. Uh, the areas in our place are such as oil palm industry. Other than that is livestock, fisheries, uh, that's all I think. All right, okay. 
So from, from that kind of industry, we, we, there's a few parameters that we can use to measure the, the, the influence from the water, uh, to, to measure the water quality. So one of it is pH um, I, um, and also ammonia and also conductivity is one of the easiest ways to measure pollutants uh, in the water. But we need to be careful with, with conductivity because uh, Ikram case is quite near uh, the downstream areas. So there's, there's a source of uh, water intrusions. So sometimes the conductivity can, um, can, can give wrong uh, false readings also. So we, we need to be careful on that. When we talk about water quality, usually the data are represented like this by the agency or researcher or academicians. It can be represented by graph, table, charts. For public, it is quite difficult to understand what it means. Furthermore, a single location data collected cannot determine or represent the water quality for the whole stretch of the river. Thus, this is how eco height Index can help to fill the gap and improve on water quality data representations. Based on the discussion with ICRAM, we can determine what kind of parameters, tools uh, that we can use to monitor the rivers. So based on the inputs, we can design the eco height Index of that particular base. Each parameter plays significant roles representing the water quality impacting the place. ICRAM is one of many groups that we engage with during, uh, during this project. Throughout the, this project, we managed to engage with four different, kind, different groups with different background and interests. Some of them located upstream and some are located up downstream. One of the main reasons they participated in this project is where they, they can get to the ground and monitor and learn about the river by themselves. Based on the science gathered data during the citizen science programs, they relate and associate with local ecological knowledge. So EcoHeart Index plays important science communication tools. The concept from heart of heart actually um, is a universal. When the community plotted the eco high index, they can easily interpret the water quality data. If the plotted graph looks like a height shape, it means that the water quality is clean. So if it doesn't, if the plotted graph looks like a broken height, um, so the water quality is polluted. Uh, with a glance through, uh, we also can know which parameter is problematic and show significant pollutions. It's much easier for them to understand. So Ikram, uh, how is the program has been useful today? Do you see any changes uh, in terms of water quality or to the community? Yes, uh, from the activity, I think have uh, some changes from the monitoring activities with the community. So I think we can, uh, all community can identify the type of pollution that always happen in the Selang River. And it can foster a responsible attitude uh, not to do pollution around the river area again. Uh, so I think that's it. Right, okay. Thank you very much, Ikram, um, for spending your time with us. Uh, so see you again next time. All right. All right, welcome. Okay, thank you, Ikram and Afan, for the sharing. Uh, lastly, I just would like to share again about our place based digital science for water conservation manual, where you can read further on how you can design and run your own digital science program. The link to download has already been shared in the chat box. So, if you have any further questions about this program, Feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, team. Um, Sarah, Afan, Asya, and Ikram, who is 
replacing Eddie, whom uh, due to some unavoidable circumstances could not be with us today. Okay, now that we have described to you the methodology, so what have we learned and what is the way forward, uh, based on the feedback from our experiment, Ikram is from Ikram as, as one of those participants, most stakeholders have positive responses about its potential. Of course, there are challenges. So we are interested to expand this program further, at least um, in several areas. I'm going to show my slides uh very quickly about you know how we think about um expanding uh the program further um first in terms of upscaling the program to the whole of slango river watershed uh we are only covering the the downstream uh area of the watershed so we would like to look at it from the whole watershed uh, perspective and if that works probably we can upscale it to other watersheds in the country in the future as well Second, uh, in terms of improvement of the tools and processes to improve water quality monitoring equipments, data analytics, data sharing mechanisms, and collaborative processes. There's many more um, improvement that can be made to make it more meaningful, cheaper, user-friendly, accurate, informative, interactive, and so forth. And third, I think uh, when we talk about sustainability, it's really about future generations. So what we want to do is we want to support our young people. So how do we want to create a feasible social enterprise business model in delivering a place-based citizen science service by locally based youth-led social enterprises, starting with um, uh, enterprises like Inspira Sekawa and Sekita Kita. Um, in terms of collaborators, uh, we have been working mostly with the downstream community of Slango River under the governance of the City Council of Kuala Slango, and our work was also supported by LUAS, the agency responsible for integrated watershed management in the state of Slango, and Yayasan Hatalega, the philanthropic arm of one of the world's largest producers of synthetic rubber gloves with factories located at the Slango River watershed. So in the future, we are planning to work with additional actors, and some of them we have had early discussions. This would include the relevant ministries, state agencies, and even United Nations uh, development program. Um, and they have a, a program called Youth Environmental Living Lab that can really support our work. We are also in discussion with um, a local environmental company who might be able to support to help us to produce more cost-effective equipment and softwares. Um, we are also getting support from AIS Lango, the water supply company for Klang Valley. Uh, they have already highlighted citizen science in the EcoHub program in their water handbook. And we are in discussions about developing actual engagement programs with them. We also have friends among the NGOs. Um, and public research institutes who have expressed their interest to work with us. Um, but uh, one new actor that we have not approached, but very important, we think, is University Slango, which is the uh, if the state-owned university uh, in, in Slango, which is very important because we, we do need um, a university that is you know very locally based. In terms of funding, uh, our work so far has only been funded by public funders including uh, Japanese Society for Promotion of Science, Ministry of Education and University of Malaya for our initial translational work on the hardware approach. And since 2018, our place-based citizen science action research has been funded by the Academy of Science Malaysia, which has unfortunately ended mid of last year. We do need new funds and in the future, we'll see whether we can also attract uh, private funding made from firms that we already know and those that are new. Indeed, this project is still largely work in progress. This is where we think our participation in TIPS conference would expose us to better ideas and strategies on how to move forward. Um, I think we have about, I don't know, I think we have about 30 minutes left. Um, so let's have an interaction. We would love to hear your comments ideas and suggestions so i think uh sarah afan and asia i think we can open the floor to the audience now uh for for discussions and inputs thank you zida uh asia and afan and also, also um ikram i think um i'm just looking at the the questions here so please put the questions in we've left some time for questions and comments uh, Teresa, thank you for your comment. She said, excellent project, amazing results, transformational. Thank you for sharing. And she's also posed a question. Thank you, Teresa. How do public policy people, um, how have they reacted to your results? Um, Afan, would you like to take that question firstly? I think you've been working with the uh, um, local and, uh, but also uh, regional, but also more um, uh, national um, 
uh, policy people. Would you would you like to respond to that? All right, uh, I, I will try to Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for the questions. So, um, citizen science is quite new in Malaysia. Um, so, the the concept of eco heart is quite. They are very interested in the eco heart concepts, uh, whereas. Uh, it's much easier for for the community to understand uh for for them as the policymakers to understand uh about the the issues uh, and also the water quality but certain people are very still skeptical with uh the data collected by citizen science scientists um they they, they still prefer sort of like uh the the, the proper uh measures uh of monitoring of water quality but this is citizen science data can give you an indicator uh indication so, so one of the case studies are uh, during the sango rivers where, where they they monitor a specific sites they they realize that there's black uh water being discharged into the rivers so they are they are curious the community are curious about it uh and they share the result with us and somehow is uh, a septic tank, whereas uh, there's a sewage line which is uh, broken and being um, discharged into the into the river. So it makes uh, the, the 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 local councils, the agencies who 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 in charge uh, on sewage came uh, and tried to fix it uh, immediately. Um, that's one of the the, the case studies. Uh, Maybe Dr. Zidam, maybe you want to add someone on that? Okay, um, but Asya, do you want to add on that as well? Or anything that you have in mind? Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Zidam. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> uh, so um, I guess the, the, the public policy people, because we are in a very experimental stage, as what as, uh, Afan was saying, uh, citizen science is quite new in, in Malaysia. And uh, even the idea of citizen science is, you know, something that is um, very interesting for the policymakers, but they would like to understand more about it. And we have invited some of the uh, key players like the agency responsible for integrated watershed management, the state of Selangor to be a part of this co-creation process. And they did give us some inputs in terms of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, how we can improve the, the accuracy or, you know, the uh, the, the 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 usefulness of the data but i think they they after a while after discussing with us they they are quite um attracted to the idea that citizen science is just an early indicator of uh pollution and they are really seeing how the local communities are able to use the eco heart index to actually communicate about water parameters which they have not been able to do so which they have not been able to do before and they have had uh, troubles in engaging with the community before this and they find this as an innovative way to, to connect with the community and also at the same time for them to learn more about the community about the water as well because before this it was it used to be a very separate process in the understanding about the community and also about the scientific uh, monitoring so I think it is it's, it's a work in progress uh, we have had very interesting conversation with the uh, uh with the policy uh community and that's why i think for the next stage we are thinking of inviting more um uh collaboration with for example with the ministry of environment uh, ministry of science technology and innovation um and also um, ministry of education in terms of improving uh the quality of the program and also to work with you know some partners as i told you as i told earlier about the local um company who can help us to improve the tools and processes in terms of uh you know making it more uh, accurate and informative and interactive for both the policymakers and also for the public uh for the for the com local community as well yeah um sarah do you have any observation you know as someone who is working with us but you know from a you know much more uh you know uh yeah i think neutral um, perspective I'll one of the really interesting things with the eco heart perspective uh, the the um the eco heart was that the parameters um the discussions that we had for quite some time about uh, matching the national um indicators for water uh, shed uh, quality so for the water quality 
we did need to look at what the national parameters were and what the what the indicators were being used, but also needing to adapt that to the local environment. Um, because as Afan and, uh, mentioned and Afan and Asia mentioned, there are some very specific activities um, that needed to be taken account of and some very specific ways of understanding the relationship to the river. So it was really important to, to bring those two worlds together. Um, and in some ways, the, the EcoHack can be adapted. It's been designed by Afan and Zida and Afan and Asi in such a way that you could take those six parameters and adapt them. Um, and we've been trialing even in uh, Wales to adapt them for well-being measures. Um, so you could adapt them as a social science more uh, indicator as well. So it's quite a useful way of uh, plotting across places so people can have a conversation about relative places. Um, but they also can have a conversation about what is meaningful to the local community. Um, Teresa, I hope that answers your question. Do we have any more questions um, in the chat box? I can't see any more, but um, I know that we're keen to answer and um, uh, support any insights that you might have. Thank you, Teresa. So would, would any um, of the audience say like to share any of their experiences in um, or any of their reflections on the eco hut, whether they think that there is use for them to, to possibly apply it? Or do we need to tell you some more about some of the um, opportunities and potentially some of the challenges that we, um, that we faced in developing this work? Maybe, probably in the meantime, I can just um, you know show the 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 the, the web the website where they get, that can provide some resources for those who are interested in in this project. Um, while we're waiting for questions, so Frank, yeah? Frank has a question. Thank you, Frank. Oh, Frank says, sometimes oh great citizen generated data points on how the current laws are being broken. So how can uh, professionals ensure that citizens continue to being motivated to provide the data? And that's a really good point. Um, I think Afan, mm. uh, you've mentioned many times about the industry and some of the challenges of working with um, industry sand mining. So shall I pass that question back to you, Afan or Asia? Would you like to answer the question? Uh, maybe Dr. Zida can, can, can answer that. Being broken. Oh uh, well. Um, okay, that's that's an interesting question. I think in you know many uh, citizen science programs, at least in especially in the advanced country like in the in the US and the UK, they are you know facing uh, this kind of you know uh, sort of conflict in terms of um, how uh, people are using citizen generated data to look at you know how laws are being broken and all that. And I think that is a part of it. And that is where we feel that the hardware approach is very important um, in the sense that, you know, what is the shared value of the of the local community and the st stakeholder of the watershed? Um, do we want to make sure that the water is not polluted? And how do we work with, you know, government agencies in terms of, uh, you know, using citizen generated data to show that the water is being polluted and what action should be taken? Um, so um, at least in our experience until now, um, uh the the you know the use of those data like for example some of the local communities um use the data to report to the to the agencies uh, on some of the activities that they see and how it is affecting the water quality it has been quite good in the sense that the agency actually come down and actually check the place and see and you know actually address address the issue but um at, 
for me, I think we are still at the early stages. We have not come to the big conflict that we see in terms of the citizen science movement that we see in the US or in the UK where, you know, it goes to the court, you know, and all that. Uh, but uh, that is something that we have to, I guess, um, uh, put in, into consideration for future development of citizen science. It is not without challenges, I'm sure. Um, but for now, it has been quite a good cooperative uh, relationship between uh, the, you know, between those who are taking care of the law and also uh, the use of the citizen generated data. So could well, you, would Afan, you, do you say, want, yeah. Would you say that you're using, that the data is being used to, to build a regulatory framework more at the local level or uh, is something else happening? Uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, legislation that, for example, for to protect the, uh, you know, that certain uh, to protect the to, to protect the river uh, and also the, the zones that is around uh, the river. But um, and the, this the data actually help uh, the, the regulators to actually um, how do you call it? To use the data to, um, uh, I, I guess it, 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 it is much more mutual in that sense, in the sense that the data is being used to um, uh, improve the implementation of the regulation. Uh, but we have not, but I think there are instances where there are controversies in terms of you know, certain types of data is being used to challenge government uh, decisions. You know, like I think, for example, the case of fracking. Um, in I, I have attended one citizen science, um, how do you call it, talk in which they are using it to challenge, uh, you know, government um, decisions that we have not seen as yet in in the case of you know our experimentation. But I'm sure those kind of challenges will. Uh, probably take place, probably, I don't know, in our context, uh, but that is something that we need to take into consideration in the future as well, uh, in terms of the, the conflict that might occur. I, I hope that answers, uh, give a bit of insights, Frank, um, to, 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 to your question. Or maybe uh, Sarah and Afwan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, that is it. Okay. So Frank, does that do you did you have a specific context in which you are experiencing some of the situation in which you have communicated or was it more just generally to ask this question of the team? And if there's any other questions about the, the work or the program, uh, we'd really, we would welcome them. Um, Zida, um, yeah. are you prepared to share the, um, the website? Yeah, I can, but, you know, I would love to hear, you know, any, at, at least, you know, even suggestions on how we can improve our work as well. But in the meantime, I can show you the um, website that we have created for this session um, so um, we have uh, why we decided to use the eco heart so you can have a read here a bit more about what the eco uh, the meaning of the eco heart and how we have applied it um, and also uh, a bit on the and also um, we have uploaded the manual that um, Sarah and also uh, Afan and Asya has mentioned this is the place-based citizen science uh, for water conservation manual that we have recently uh, published and actually this is the first time that we are showing it to the public and you can download it um, and if you have more questions or you know additional support uh, for training you can contact Afan and Asya uh, to to have more information on this as a you know as a support to their social enterprise um, and then uh, there is also uh, some stories about Slango River Watershed, uh, a bit about the community. Uh, we have a video about, you know, what the community appreciates about the, the river, about the watershed and also uh, the book that we have produced in terms of the interpretive materials that has shaped the way we design EcoHeart Index for uh, for this particular watershed. So what we are saying is that for other watersheds, there might be other interpretive materials that we can produce uh, based on the place-based citizen science uh, program. Uh, 
and some additional resources on you know what are on the on the uniqueness of the uh, of the Slango River watershed, and then uh, we have also uh, put up. Um, the general articles and uh, the book, um, in the, some presentations on our hardware approach uh, that uh, provides the umbrella um, philosophy behind our work and also some of our publications on place-based citizen science. Actually, our eco Hut Index was published in the Journal of Ecological Indicators in 2018 and um starting from just a, you know, a much more theoretical work um and and a, you know writing the the, the 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 results of our work in a general article now we have translated it into an actual program we have also a publication that looks into our opinion about citizen science in the context of developing countries a bit of our reflection in terms of um not only our work in citizen science in the context of this project but also for other types of uh, citizen science program, especially the City Nature Challenge that we have conducted in 2018 and 2019. Um, both me and Sarah was also involved in this uh, paper, um, uh, a special issue on citizen science uh, in the Journal of Applied Ecology. And finally, our, ma uh, our manual, which you can download to know more about our work. So yeah, even if you, you, know, you have questions, even after this session, please feel free to contact us. We would love to engage with you if you have any, uh, you know, any, any interest to, to collaborate or to discuss with us about, you know, our idea about place-based citizen science. So, Teresa, thank you, has, has posted an, another question which is very helpful. So, Teresa asks, going to second order learning processes, which learning at this level do you identify as derived from your program? Zina, do you want to um, to respond to some of the the kind of um, further learning around the the program? Uh, second order learning, I guess. Um, you know, I, I I will give it a shot. This is a difficult question, um, but definitely, I mean, if you look at citizen science, of course, the you know the first type of learning is actually looking at the learning about the science, right? About uh, water quality uh, parameters, you know, how do you translate the uh, the status of the water quality of a particular water body? But I think the second order learning is really about, if I understand what second order learning is, um, is how do you connect with, you know, that, that straightforward uh, scientific understanding about the water quality with how it connects to the meaning behind the um, uh, behind those data with how the water is of value to the community and what kind of action that can be taken um, from that understanding. So I think the second order learning is really to think about, okay, what is the problem here? What is the complexity of the problem that we see, not only in terms of the status of the water quality, but our, how does it connect to our value and what is important to us and what can we do to solve the problem? And I think that kind of conversation is very valuable um, and a conversation between the local communities and the stakeholders has been very constructive in thinking about, uh, you know, using a place-based citizen science for, you know, broader sort of engagement and, you know, policy action even uh, in terms of improvement. So and that so is my, just, my thinking. Just to follow on there too, I think some of the reflections on that, on the processes of developing the place-based citizen science has been to see both the kinds of skills that have been developed in the in the local community. So the, uh, so reflecting on what we thought we knew people, what we thought people knew about a place and how we could translate that. That's been very interesting learning about connecting what we thought, what we thought we knew or what we expected people should know and how you yeah. can integrate that into the program. Seeing the development and the confidence of, um, the young people through Inspiration Kawi has been really, um, really interesting and really um, powerful to see. Um, so actually, the working with young people, working with um, local communities, has to see 
a real value in the knowledge that they hold about the river and the work that the knowledge they already had but actually being able to have a mechanism for communicating that and feeling that that knowledge is valuable um, and I think some of the other learning is um, also what didn't work. So I think, you know, there were opportunities. I mean, we, we did some of this work during COVID, uh, during lockdowns um, internationally. So things that we had to communicate and understand through each other um, and things that we have had to learn about um, working with some of the assumptions about what citizen science wants to achieve and how uh, effective that can be in practice or how problematic that can be in practice. So I think some of our kind of assumptions about what citizen science does and can achieve and yeah. what citizen science, how it viewed, so there's quite a few things there, how citizen science also viewed social research. So how the kind of the mainstream citizen science has responded to thinking about these social, these dimensions of place more critically actually um, you know, is our science good enough for kind of citizen science? I think that question's come back. So there's been a number of different kind of learnings around, um, as I said, what didn't work, seeing community um, develop uh, expertise and confidence in their knowledge, and also our understanding of what we thought, um, the kinds of knowledge that we thought should or could be, or that people would hold in a citizen science context. So I to add, uh, Sarah, I just wanted to add a bit uh, in terms of, you know, how um, I think this provides a new language. And when we talk about localizing SDGs, um, I guess uh, this kind of tools can provide a much more creative, you know, a rooted and, you know, a much more meaningful way when we talk about the SDGs, because you can't just talk, you know, when we want to talk about second order learning in terms of, you know, understanding sustainable development of a particular place, um, it's not easy to just talk about, you know, um, the relationship between the SDGs, right? And that is, you know, a big way of thinking about systems thinking and all that. But when you talk about it in terms of, you know, focusing it from the interpretation of the of the if the of the eco hard index it is it looks simple but it's complex and, and and you can talk with the local community about the different problems that is related to the different sdgs but in a way that in a language that they can relate to and they can understand and I think that is, um, you know, when we talk about localizing SDGs, we got to find different way of communicating that and making it much more interactive for diff and make it much more inclusive in terms of the people who can participate in that conversation. So, uh, so I, it's just I just want to add to that, Sarah. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, as today's, as you said, and certainly reflecting on the value of water. <laughs> Um, yeah, so those kind of, as we were saying, those kind of everyday assumptions. I think we've only got a couple more minutes left for any additional questions um, or any additional comments. Um, I know there's just a small group of yeah. us here. Um, and uh, Bella, you um, posted at the start about the work that you've been doing in um, the agriculture and mineral industry, looking at the SDGs. Um, and maybe there's other um, contributions that, or other uh, perspectives that um, other audience members here might uh, like to add. Well, if if not, I know that everybody has four very busy days of conference. Yeah. So we really are grateful for the time that you've taken to listen to us today. Um, and I'd like to thank, um, or I'd, I'd leave um, Zida to 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 thank um, everyone. Uh, Ola, thank Zida and uh, Asia and Afran and Ikram, and just to, to thank you for your time today. Um, we realise time is a very precious resource for everybody. All right, thank you everyone for being with us, and we appreciate your your comments and you know your, your presence with us. Okay, thank you.